Roll. Yes. Um, Roll. Roll. So I'm very gl glad to announce you a wonderful work mm -hmm. that a project that me and Juliet Bates are working with, which is the Lucifer Collection. The Lucifer co Collection, um, it's really a marvelous project. We have just uh, made a video focusing on it today, having a discussion about it. We will reprint the entire Lucifer uh, but divided in topics. As you can see here, for example, editorials will be the first volume, Buddhism, Magic Kabbalah, Christianity, Dreams and Visions, Ghosts and Vampires. Uh, the Lucifer Collection will be divided in the Lucifer Collection, the Blavatsky Years, and the Lucifer Collection, the post-Blavatsky Years. The Lucifer Collection, the Blavatsky Years, will be composed of 12 volumes. And um, we have the website here with the announcement that you can visit. We will post a link. As you know, Liz Lucifer was designed to bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Um, this was the motto of Lucifer magazine, and it was the magazine of Madame Blavatsky, which first, uh, the first issue um, came, was released in uh, September of uh, 1887, and the last one, I think, around September of 1887. Um, uh, and then the magazine changed the name to Theosophical Review. I'll be, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Mercury Retrograde. <laughs> there will be. Okay, so I'll be posting the link to Lucifer Magazine online um, on the chat so you can have a look and you will be receiving news and updates about it. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen now. Juliet, over to you. Okay, let me make a little bit of space here. Admit. Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to the European School of Theosophy this Sunday. My name is Juliet Bates and I am part of the school team. The school was founded in 1981 by Geoffrey Farthing and other theosophists. This year we will focus on the study of the secret doctrine. We will also be offering lectures, online courses, and seminars on a variety of topics. We suggest registering for our weekly newsletter so you can keep updated on our program and not miss anything. The EUST is a not-for-profit organization and the large majority of our programs are free of charge. So please support the work of the school by making a donation. Our online lectures, but not seminars, are also transmitted live on our YouTube channel, and you can register to our channel by visiting the link you see in the chat. A healing circle has been organized, facilitated by myself, and it will meet once a month. The next will be on Sunday 28th, which is next Sunday, at 4 p.m. GMT. If you would like to participate or wish to include a name into our healing book, please send an email to eustheosophy at gmail.com. Today, we will have the pleasure of listening to Mary Abdil and her very interesting lecture on spirituality in comics, which I'm sure we will really enjoy. Her lecture will also be transmitted live on YouTube and the video will be available online. Next Saturday, we will have a very special event at 5 p.m. GMT, as Erika Georgiades will be interviewing the international president of the Theosophical Society, Tim Boyd, who has chosen to honor us with his time and share his experience and wisdom. You will be able to watch the interview on our YouTube channel 
So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. The link can be seen in our chat. Our next seminar, Navigating the Battle of Life, will begin on the 6th of March with Dr. Ravi Ravindra, who will be sharing his precious insights into the Bhagavad Gita over seven Saturdays. This will be a rare opportunity and registration is now open. Further details will appear in our next newsletter and it is suggested if you do not have a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, perhaps to have one ready. Due to the length of Dr. Ravinda's seminar, the Secret Doctrine Seminar with Erika Georgiades has to be moved to a later date in the year. Our February lectures will draw to a close next Sunday when we can listen to Tim Wyatt and his enthralling lecture on Secrets of Death. The book with the Proceedings of the European School of Theosophy 2019, Reincarnation, Science and the Ancient Wisdom Tradition is available both on Kindle and in printed format from Amazon. But hot from the presses, ta-da, is the EUST's beautiful color version of practical vegetarian cookery from 1897 written by Countess Constance, Constance Wachtmeister and Kate Buffington Davis. The first vegetarian cookbook published in California and this is a must have, it's a beautiful book and it's available on Amazon internationally. As you can see, we have lots going on. So please continue to support this great work by making a donation to the EUST, which is a not-for-profit platform. The way today's meeting will be conducted, as you know, is that your microphones will be muted and you will not be able to unmute yourself. After the lecture, if you would like to ask a question, you can either write it in the chat or use the raise hand icon option. Your microphone will then be unmuted for you to ask your question. And thank you for listening. Now, it is my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Mary Abdill is the founder and president of Creative Data Movers Inc. and brings to her company rich and diverse technical and training experience. Mary is a consultant, IT instructor, courseware developer, and popular stand-up instructor with specialized skills in the area of application design and development. She brings to her students a rich and diverse technical and training experience. A skilled and enthusiastic instructor, Mary teaches a wide variety of mainframe and web application development courses and workshops for IT developers, support personnel, and end users. New York University's School of Continuing Education recognized Mary's outstanding ability as an educator by presenting her with the school's award for teaching excellence and promoting her to adjunct assistant professor. Mary has also taught a number of courses at Columbia University. Corporate on-site boot camps are one of Mary's specialities. She has designed, developed, and taught numerous highly successful web application developer, mainframe applications, and developer boot camps, ranging from a few months to many over six months long or five days a week. The student audiences have ranged from CC++ programmers learning COBOL, to mainframers enhancing their skills by learning web development, as well as recent IT graduates and students new to programming who learn to develop business applications. These were in-depth boot camps that enhanced students' existing skills, as well as teaching them good coding practices and industry standards. The boot camps were all customized to the client's existing computing environment and standards. Mary's courseware design skills are evident in the unique style she has developed 
for creative data movers instructional manuals. She displayed similar expertise as co-author of four versions of Fast Access Lotus 123, as Simon and Schuster self-study text on business applications of PC software. Prior to forming her own company in 1984, Mary managed the advanced programming curriculum and developed the PC curriculum for a major communications company, addressing the training needs of system developers, programmers, operations and end users. Her area of expertise focuses on application development and programming with strong abilities in the areas of systems and operations support. As an application developer and technical consultant, Mary has developed systems from bookstore, bookstore query and order systems to telephone data capture systems, registration systems, art history database systems, and numerous report and update systems. She has provided consulting and training support for many major financial institutions, including many banks and brokerage firms, utilities, insurance firms, retail industry, industry companies, and non-profit institutions. Recently, Mary developed and recorded two technical e-learning courses using Camtasia and a webcam. She has successfully taught many virtual training classes to remote students, once from her hotel room in January 2011, when snow prevented students from reaching the classroom. Wow. So welcome once again, Mary. We are honored to have you here today and are looking forward to learning about spirituality in comics. So let me pass the word over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wasn't expecting you to read my whole, you must have pulled that off of the web. <laughs> no, I didn't send it to you, <laughs> but thank you. Would you do me a favor and give me a five minute warning because I realize I don't have a clock nearby. Okay, and, sure enough. And I have, I have about four hours worth of um, material. So I need to just be told to stop. Will do. I've been collecting comics for, for decades and growing up, it was a fight every morning, especially Sunday morning, for who would get the comic strips, you know, in the family. Who would who would get to read the comic strips first? My father was also an avid comic strip reader, and I began to notice how many comics had spiritual ideas in them. What I'm going to focus on today is not the superhero type of comics which are very much like, um, you know, the representing, you know, God or Jesus or people, you know, that are able to, to make everything well again in, America, in miracle ways, but rather the spirituality that shows up in everyday comics. And it really is amazing how much shows up every day. I am going to uh, come over here, page down. Um, I'm going to quote Juliet Bates. This is something she posted before, and I thought this was great. So the aim of my talk is to show how the wisdom teachings are very present in our daily lives, and yet we may not recognize or consider them as such. And that from a very young age, we are surrounded by the teachings, but we're often unaware of how they have been positioned to inspire and lead us down the spiritual path of knowledge and unfoldment. Quote from Julia Bates. Thank you, Juliet. Um, also, this was a comic that's out there. Um, not all the comics are funny. Some of them are just profound and some of them are funny. And I will take this thing off the bottom so you can see the whole thing. Hide that. So what we have is um, when we climb to our, along our path, that if we try to take the steps are too big, we can't reach them. So it's really important to have smaller steps so that we can climb up um, to our spiritual destination or recognize our spiritual links. 
So comics appeal to people of all ages. <clears throat> if you were to Google comics and spirituality, um, at the time that I did this, which was some, some years ago, there was over 60 million hits. So there's a lot of stuff out there on comics and spirituality. They're in comic books, they're in newspapers. <clears throat> Where I have found my most recent source of comics is something called gocomics.com. And of course, Dilbert is out there as well. And I picked out probably a hundred of my favorite comics that I look at almost every day. And usually there's at least one or two that have some spiritual impact. So they appeal to the general public and the fact that these comics have so many references to spirituality or living the life or the path just shows how ubiquitous these ideas have come. Comics are not just something that's funny or um, spiteful or uh, you know, sarcastic or something. They're actually, there's a lot of spiritual references in them. I'm not going to talk about the writers of these. I'm not going to be talking about, you know, some of the background um, of the authors of these comics. Of course, many of them probably have, you know, studied or been affected um, or following some sort of spiritual path in their life. But what comes out, and these are popular comics, I find just fascinating. So, we have comics that are the common folk, and that's what I'm going to be looking at. These are families or individuals or friends who faced ethical dilemmas and life-changing choices that affect what they're going to do. And you see a lot of spirituality in how they make their choices. I'm not gonna be talking about the superheroes, the Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, Ninja Turtles, Flash Gordon, etc. These superheroes do fight battle and they save the world from disaster. <clears throat> and, they, <clears throat> and they often perform actual miracles. There are books written, many books written on these superheroes. I'm not even going to touch them any more than what I just said now. The comics often portray myths. They, put, they portray a, a truth that is beyond rational meaning. It is beyond a practical explanation, but we sort of understand it intuitively. These comics often inspire us to do good. I've grouped the comics into many different groupings from invisible worlds, peace, meditation, gurus, reality, auras, temptation, etc. So this is kind of like my grouping. If I'm only up to ethics and she gives me the five minute warning, I'll sort of switch over to, to search and go to question and answer. I have hundreds of comics that I've not included in this talk. I, re I regularly go through and update my comics. So many comics are about the spiritual journey. Sometimes it's the author's spiritual journey, but we see the journey through the character's spiritual journey. So let's look at the invisible worlds around us. Many people accept the existence of angels and other invisible beings. So this is Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Waterman. I try to put the author down um, at the bottom of the slide um, on every slide. I wasn't totally successful because some people will send me, a lot of people send me comics and I don't necessarily know who wrote them. So if you send me a comic, <laughs> include, include the uh, author. So Calvin is a young boy and he has a, a stuffed tiger and that stuffed tiger comes to life when he's alone with the tiger, but when other people are around, it's just a stuffed toy. So he's, he talks a lot to his tiger and you'll see Calvin coming up a lot. Cal, the tiger's name is Hobbes. I think angels are everywhere, you do? Yes, they're on calendars, books, greeting cards, just almost every product available. What a spiritual world we live in. So peace is another thing that shows up a lot in the comics, either finding inner peace or outer peace. So this is one, I don't know where it came from. Someone sent it to me. Come on, inner peace. I'm meditating and I don't have all damn day. Sorry for the curse word. Uh, Nancy by Guy Gilchrist 
is another popular one that has a lot of spiritual in it. So can you be happy with nothing? Nothing comes up a lot in the spiritual world. You know, we come from nothing, we go to nothing. Um, nothing is our own true home. So we have, they say you can be happy with, if they say if you can be happy with nothing, you haven't made. I have so much nothing that I'm ecstatic. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, peanuts is another very popular one. And Peanuts by Carl Schultz. Um, even Lucy tries to reduce violence and strive for peace. So we have the dog. It was a dark and stormy night. Suddenly a shot ran out, rang out. And Lucy says, and this is really funny because Lucy is usually the one that bops people on the head. Isn't there enough violence in the world today? Can't you write about something nice? So he changes it. It was a dark and stormy night. Suddenly a kiss rang out. Mindfulness, Thich Nhat Hanh has uh, talked a lot about mindfulness and Agnes has shown a lot of, I'm gonna hide this thing again, it keeps coming up. Agnes is another comic strip that shows a lot of spiritual ideas in it. So here's Agnes talking to her friend Trout. They're both young girls. Agnes says, ever since that guy we saw on TV told us to start practicing mindlessness, I have discovered true peace. Trout, he didn't say mindlessness, he said mindfulness. Then she says, oh, well, peace is peace. You know, and it gets you to think about the difference between mindlessness and mindfulness. Meditation and Nirvana. Actually, the word Nirvana is showing up in comic strips, amazingly enough. And meditation shows up a lot. It's good for everything, starting with relaxation. <clears throat> so here we have Garfield. The cat is named Garfield, uh, Jim Davis. Talks about emptiness. And Garfield sits there on the meditation seat and says, I shall now meditate and find my center. I sense that my center is empty. I shall fill my center with a donut. So it talks about meditation and then sort of throws a, a funny quirk at the end. But the thought is there. The thought is there about the center and emptiness being part of meditation. And of course, this is a classic. It shows up in a lot of um, comics when we have um, the ohm sounds very much like home on the range. So <clears throat> the, uh, Frank and Ernest are these two um, young men or two men. And they say, they see this dude ranch and they say they have meditation classes. And he says, ohm on the range. So, you know, bringing the idea of the sacred sound into comics. Uh, this is one I um, comes from um, Sives. Whoa, the individual ego does not exist. Meditate some more, meditate some more. Suddenly, I am so freaking enlightened. So we have this idea that the individual ego not existing and suddenly the ego comes in full play and recognizes and, and is very proud of itself. Uh, Mark Twain said um, to, uh, in, in a book where he was talking to, um, oh, forget the word, but uh, uh, a, a, a young Satan to be um, on earth. And th that young, that young uh, tempter is attempting to bring uh, his patient, another human, uh, over to the, um, to the evil side, side of hell. And the person is becoming very humble. And so, Satan reminds the young tempter, have you reminded him of it? If you remind him, he will become proud of his attempt to become humble. So the ego pops up in so many ways. And a Buddhist compliment, 
I've never met anyone so thoughtless in my life. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Master. And meditation again, emptying the mind. Frank and Ernest. Frank says to Ernest, they put me in an accelerated class. My mind was already empty. You know, the, the real meaning of emptying your mind and then just having no thoughts whatsoever. Um, and here we have two monks watching television and the one monk says, there's nothing on. And the second, excellent, let's watch that. Again, uh, Simpra. And this one, I think you've probably all seen. One monk says to the, to the guru, oh master, is it proper for a monk to use email? Master, sure, as long as there are no attachments. And Nirvana, I said, came up, the concept of Nirvana, but this time it's been switched into Nerdvana. Dilbert, I have become one with my computer. And sometimes I think I have become one with my computer. I'm on it so often. Gilbert, it is a feeling of ecstasy, the perfect blend of logic and emotion. I have reached, and the dog says, nerdvana. So if you didn't know, it, he's expecting you to know that nirvana is uh, the play on words here. He's expecting you to know that. So Nirvana has reached the Dilbert comics and Dilbert is a very popular comic strip. Uh, and I told you dogs would be here. So here's your dog. There'll be more dogs. Actually, this is the second dog. We, ha we had the dog in Peanuts as well. So woof, woof dogs. So meditation benefits are often misunderstood. So <clears throat> here we have the, egg, the talking egg this is in something called U.S. Acres, and it's farm animals that communicate with each other. And the rooster here is kind of egocentric and a bully. And the young, the young egg, which is very um, peaceful and, and giving and, and sharing, and, and he says, feel free, I'm taking a break now, Roy, that's the rooster, feel free to use my meditation mount. The rooster looks at the mount, looks around, sits and says, I wish I had a pony. So the purpose of meditation, is the purpose of meditation to get something? A lot of people misunderstand that, but we have Roy, the sarcastic rooster, um, showing how meditation can be misunderstood. Um, some of you have seen those little Zen gardens. They're, oh, you know, like, in fact, students of mine even gave me one um, it's sand and it has a, a little things, little um, objects in it, seashells and rocks and stuff, and a little rake and you rake it like you would a big one, except that it's a small one. It sits on your desk. And so <clears throat> we have savage chickens. This is one of them. And he says, I used to spend hours and hours in quiet contemplation, but not anymore thanks to Electro Zen. So he has an automated Zen garden or a robotic Zen garden. The, meditate the easy way with your electro Zen robotic Zen garden. So you don't have to, to spend hours in contemplation anymore. Let the robot do it for you. This actually shows up a number of times. The Zen thought for the day, the Zen master's office, and there's your thought for the day. As you see, nothing in the quotes. This comes up from non sequitur. Uh, Wiley Miller did another one of these. And here we have the guru sitting up there with the Zen thought for the day. Again, nothing in the quotes. And the two people that came to see the guru on the mountain said, ironically, you have to think about it for a minute. So you have to think about the thought that is nothing. And that's one of those contradictions. It's a, how do you not think about the thought for the day when you realize that you're thinking about it? So I like that very much. So yoga is more than just exercise. It's a, 
is a meditation. And we have, of course, any excuse to avoid, to avoid our own self-improvement. So family tree is a family. This is the mother and she's talking to a friend. And the mother says, I've been so stressed, I'm getting back into yoga. Friend, good idea. We all need to be peaceful, time to center and renew our soul. Go for it. I would, but my workout duds are so totally last year. In other words, we'll find any excuse we can not to meditate, not to improve ourselves. And again, here's the mom. I'm getting back into my yoga routine, but I think I need to join a regular class. I'm having trouble centering. In other words, even in the down dog position, we can't get rid of the phone. We're on that phone. It's like attached to us. People don't seem to understand why I don't carry my cell phone around with me all the time. It's over, it's over in another room actually. Um, they think as soon as they text me, I should respond. So here's again, um, and here's that word nirvana coming up. Again, you'd think that nirvana was not an everyday word, but here it is in a popular comic strip. This one is all about you. Now, the woman is very egocentric and she has a friend. So she says, have you ever thought about meditation as an alternative to watching TV? And he says, I don't know. On one hand, I'm not really a meditation sort of guy. On the other hand, when I watch TV, I'm already actively engaged in an activity where I focus on one thing, my breathing and heart rate slow down, and afterwards I feel relaxed and refreshed. Obviously he's not watching the news, right? And he says, watching reruns of Scrubs is as close as I'm gonna to get to Nirvana. Again, just throwing that word out there. Somehow it's expected, the, Tony Murphy expects that you have some idea what Nirvana means. It just shows up in the comic strip. Shirley and Son. Um, the son has a, 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 a friend, now Shirley is the mother, and the son is saying, I've decided that the secret of getting through a day of school is meditation. If you can zone out all the outside distractions, you can reach a state of mental bliss where time is irrelevant. It all sounds great. Of course, that may require you to take the entire third grade over again. <coughs> Excuse me. But if time is irrelevant anyway, what difference would that make exactly? So we have this idea of time. Is time important? Is it irrelevant? Is meditation important? Are there, are there um, benefits or pros and cons to meditation? So it, it gets you to think about it. And again, this is a topic that two kids are having, third graders. You know, they're not even teenagers yet. Fraz is one that I particularly like. Fraz is a custodian at an elementary school. And apparently, this was not true for me, but apparently for a lot of kids, the one adult they can trust at the school is the custodian. The custodian helps clean up their messes and that kind of thing. And so Fraz, there's a lot of comics I have on with Fraz. Fraz is talking with his girlfriend and he's been meditating. And he says a beautiful sunset, notice the word sunset can prompt big ponderances. How old was I when I saw my first one? Did I appreciate it? How did some of the prettiest colors in the spectrum, how did it score some of the prettiest colors? Do some of these hues even exist elsewhere in nature? Is it a reward for a day well lived or no questions asked? And again, he's talking sunset. And then he says, well, why is it at my back? And she says, Big ponderances can make me fall asleep too. So he's slept through the sunset and it's already 
morning. And as you can see, the sun is rising. I think I read through the whole thing and had to go back initially and say, how do we know it's morning? And then I see the sunrise. So <clears throat> reflection as meditation is very important. <clears throat> And of course, sometimes big ponderances can make us fall asleep in meditation as well. Here we're back to it's all about you again. Um, I love coffee, but it's bad for my skin. It gives me stomach cramps. It causes heartburn. His friend says, to keep doing something that's bad for you doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but I need to stop doing things but, but to, sorry, but to stop doing things, I really want to, I need something stronger than logic. And this comic hit home with many, many of my friends is why do we do what we do in spite of everything? Why do we do what we do when we know it's not right? Why do we keep doing stuff? Why do we believe what we believe even we think is not true? And why don't we meditate? You know, we find excuses. We need something stronger than logic. Something has to hit us that's stronger than logic. So it seems to apply to everything in life. And again, many of my friends just totally understood this comic. It's, it's great. Uh, Rose is Rose. Rose is the woman here. <clears throat> she's married. She's got kids. This is her husband down here. She has this tree that she goes to. This is her home, the trees in the backyard. And she says, whenever I'm anxious about a difficult decision I have to make, my let it be tree helps me calmly assess the problem. So she leans against the tree. I simply lean against my tree. I relax and lean. I breathe and lean some more and eventually I am truly able to just let things be. Now I can return to my life with a fresh perspective. Uh-oh, Jumbo doesn't look very happy. That's her husband. Jumbo's on the phone. He says, how much is a new water heater? Whoa, that much? So he comes over and leans on the tree as well. And he says, are we allowed to talk? And she says, just lean. Dora Kuntz that Ed has talked about and both of us knew for decades, um, led a lot of meditation workshops. She would say, just go and lean against a tree. I don't know whether Don Wimmer or Pat Brady ever met Dora or heard about her tree leaning, but she would say, go sit beside a tree, go touch a tree, put your hands on the tree. Feel the tree, be one with the tree. And her let it be tree shows up in a lot of her comic strips. Peanuts again, Charles Schultz. Books have been written by the way on the, um, <laughs> the spirituality and Peanuts comic strip. <clears throat> so we have Worrying won't stop the bad stuff from happening. It just stops you from enjoying the good. So they're pondering that. More on meditation. The secrets of the universe will be revealed if you meditate. Can't you just tell me the secrets? And that sounds a lot like our early theosophists asking the masters, don't make me work for it, just tell me. And the guru says, <clears throat> to meditate, you must clear your mind of all thoughts. If I have no thoughts, how will I know if I'm meditating? <clears throat> More questions. <clears throat> how do I come out of it? I won't know. I won't be able to, to think about stopping. I won't be able to think about stopping because I'm not thinking. And shouldn't stupid people be the best meditators of all? And the guru says, perhaps you're not ready. So more on gurus and spiritual teachers, how to find your guru. So the comic strip F minus, 
we have the um, the searcher climbing the path to the guru, and halfway up he comes to this um, this meditator, and he says, "Talk to the guy at the top about enlightenment. I'm more about those aha moments." And we have many aha moments on our path to enlightenment. And I love this one. Please use the other entrance. You got the wrong path to the guru. Frank and Ernest again. First, you say I should know myself. And then you tell me to extinguish my ego. It's, it's, a conflict. it's, it's, it's a conflict. I can't seem to do both. How do I know myself and then extinguish my ego? So it is really talking about what is the ego. Enlightenment sounds okay, but I've decided to go with willful ignorance instead. And then this one, I love this one, enlightenment, $5. Hey, I gave you a 20, where's my change? Change comes from within. You kind of had to read that sign first to know that you're supposed to get $15 back. Change comes from within. Here's more on the ego. Ziggy, um, Tom Wilson and Tom too. You have finally managed to extinguish your ego. Congratulations. And you get a, he gets a, an award for most enlightened. Kind of defeats the purpose of extinguishing the ego. So this conflict between extinguishing the ego and working on it reflecting on it, becoming proud of your efforts, kills the whole accomplishment. Here's social media, again, here's the, uh, the searcher, here's the guru, thanks for your visit. Don't forget to change your Facebook status to enlightened. Let everyone know you've been enlightened. Kind of defeats the purpose. Astral plane and auras. Um, there's some amazing ways that people think of astral planes and auras. This one is a, a classic. The um, lead, the, the master is looking at all the monks and he says, in exchange for voluntarily giving up all desire for your current seat, you will receive an abundance of good karma as well as a voucher good for travel to any of the infinite destinations we serve throughout the comic, cosmic universe, sorry, cosmic universe. So this is the overbooked plane, the overbooked astral plane. So this is what happens when astral planes are overbooked. Your, your reward will be good karma if you give up your astral seat. Agnes. Again, Agnes and her friend Trout. Trout says, I had this weird dream last night. Agnes, maybe it was astral projection. Trout, astral what? Projection. Your astral body separates from your physical body and travels in the astral plane. Trout, you're out of your mind. Well, maybe I'm astral thinking. So, it, gives, it brings in this idea of astral projection, astral, that we're more than our body, your astral body. So it's, it's making you think about more than just the physical. And I'm gonna skip this one because we're running out of time, I'm sure. So we all have auras, but we have again, some strange ideas about them. Uh, fat cats is about some very self-centered, um, cats that run their own business. And this is the masseuse. And the fat cat, Leo says, I'm too tired for a massage. The masseuse, then can I leave? No way, I prepaid. You'll massage my proxy. Your proxy? So this is the dog. And he says, be gentle, this is my first massage. The masseuse, I'll start with your aura. And actually, massaging the aura, <laughs> is does have an effect even though this was a joke 
Therapeutic touch, of course, brings that idea of working with the aura. How much is it, how much harder is it to believe in the aura and other dimensions? So here's the, the twins, the boy and the girl, fraternal twins, they're babies. And the little girl says, why are you getting so hysterical? Mommy and daddy are gone. They just walked out of the room. You are aware that the world extends beyond the room that we're in. Great. My sister believes in science fiction. But this idea that we have this physical world and there's more to it that we don't see. We're in a room or we're in a country or we're in a city or we're in a state or we're in a family. And it's so hard to see beyond the limits of whatever those boundaries are that we, we have boundaries, so many boundaries. And it's so hard to see beyond those boundaries. And people that do see beyond those boundaries, the rest of the world says, wow, you're crazy. You believe in science fiction. Here's, an, here's another one with fat cats. Again, Leo. Um, the masseuse says, instead of giving you a massage, I want to adjust your aura. Why? You've got a negative field that needs redirecting. I can do this without even my paws ever touching your body. And so he's waving his hands around over Leo's back. And Leo says, I think it's working. Meanwhile, the masseuse is reading a magazine and says, shush, it works better if you don't talk. So it's kind of like making fun of the aura, but it's still bringing the word aura into everyday life. It's bringing the word aura into the people who would not necessarily have any thoughts about um, a, science, uh, a spiritual or religious um, connotation here. Reality, what is real? What is Maya? What is unreal? The world of illusion. This comes up in several strips as well. Back to Agnes. Um, Agnes says to Trout, I cannot come up with a rational explanation of my existence. Therefore, I may not be real. For instance, I can see me, but with my eyes, which are part of me, I'm trying to verify. I may only see me because I so much want me to exist. Are you even listening? And Trout says, I wish my ears weren't real. But this whole idea of Am I real because I think I'm real, but then I'm the one that's thinking that I'm real? So that whole uh, confusion about what is reality and, and what is it that's thinking I'm real, or maybe I'm not real. Maybe it's all an illusion. So this was again, uh, Agnes and Trout are very similar to the Prince and Paganino in the magic flute. The one who thinks and the one who's the very practical. Some more, are you for real? Is the brochure real? Agnes, I've decided that I am indeed very real and I'm writing a brochure for other people who may be questioning their existence as well. Trout decides to play a game. What brochure? I don't see anything. Agnes looks at it and says, <laughs> I have, she's gonna be a real hoot in college. So. People can get teased for, for questioning, questioning the path, questioning reality, questioning uh, where they're going, questioning beyond our dimensions. Again, that whole, there's a whole series of strips on this, are you for real? Are, what is reality? And back to Dilbert, the, um, the garbage collector. So we have in, in Fraz, we have the custodian who's brilliant. And in Dilbert, we have the garbage collector who's the um, really brilliant one. <clears throat> and garbage collector is talking with Rat and Rat's sitting on a garbage can. Rat says, what is reality, Mr. Garbage Man? Garbage Man, are you sure you're ready for that, Ratbird? My mind is a blank slate. 
Okay. Time and motion are just illusions created by your inability, inability to perceive everything at once. Already profound. Time and motion are just illusions created by your inability to perceive everything at once. Everything that is possible exists as a path. You simply choose the path you wish to perceive. The only things you can't change are the experiences you have already perceived. Ratbert, my head hurts. The contents of a garbage can are determined by what path I choose to perceive, not by what someone else chose to discard. Hey, there's a new VCR in here. Come on, I'm expecting some great videos in the O'Brien's can. So we suddenly get down to the practical, hey, you know, I can retrieve stuff from the garbage. In New York City, we sometimes call that sidewalk shopping. As you're walking down the sidewalk, people will throw out really nice things, bookshelves. Uh, I've even acquired several cats that way. Um, the cats have been sort of sitting in the garbage. Um, uh, tables, chairs, lamps. I mean, people will throw this stuff out. So, so here we have gone from the really profound down to the sidewalk shopping. Temptation. There are so many ways to fall off the spiritual path or even just the path of our everyday life. So here we have um, up in heaven, we have all the do-gooders. And here we have um, Satan with the express elevator that goes uh, down. And Satan is saying, come on, there's nothing up here except vegetarians, environmentalists, and other do-gooders tempting people to go have some fun. In fact, it's been said that I think Mark Twain said this, why do so many people want to go to heaven when they hate going to church when all they do in church is listening, is listening to the pastor and singing hymns? And they think that heaven is all about singing hymns and they, but they don't wanna to go to church for that, but they do wanna to go to heaven. Back to Agnes. <clears throat> so we have this idea that Money is the root of all evil or the love of money is the root of all evil. So Agnes asked Trout, if you had to choose right now, would you choose fame, wealth, or power? Trout, none. I would choose happiness. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Okay, now really. So we sometimes block, sometimes block, um, what we really feel with what we think we're supposed to feel. So temptation. Do small sins lead to bigger crimes? And we have Fraz, we have this, the, um, the teacher, and we have the young elementary student. And the young elementary student happens to be fairly profound and he says to the teacher, you're right. You can't just blow off a whole year's lesson plan and just coast every four weeks. She says, instead, just coast through every fourth week. No one will notice. You know, like, take it easy. Every fourth week, don't bother teaching. Just coast through it. And the teacher says, stop it or go back to being preposterous. And the student says, temptation is tastiest in the small doses. So we just have one small piece of candy, one small piece of chocolate, one small piece of cake. Eventually we have a lot of small pieces and the whole cake is gone. And <clears throat> teacher says, did you read screw tape letters? And the student says, depends on which week you ask me. So was it the fourth week or the other weeks? So temptation is tastiest in small doses. So here's temptation. The, um, the tiger is sleeping. 
He's running, he's ru jumping, and he pounces on poor Calvin. Calvin's always being afraid that the tiger will um, pounce on him. <clears throat> Altruism. Why do we help people? This is a huge question. Do we help other people because of the benefits that we will receive, the honor that we receive? Do we help other people because it will get us to heaven? Do we help other people because it will get us further on the path to enlightenment? Why do we help other people? And this is explored in the comics. So sometimes we have the right action helping for the wrong reason. <clears throat> and then sometimes the reason will change correspondingly. Let's, and so sometimes, even though we had the wrong reason, our reason will change because we see the benefits and we begin to help just to help. So let's look at a self-centered single woman who loves beautiful clothes and is searching for the handsome Mr. Right. But actually I threw in here um, a Motley classic first. <clears throat> so here's Santa Claus. And the kid is saying, holy cow, Santa, you're wasting away to nothing. If you don't eat, no one will recognize you. And then Santa says, good, then I won't have to listen to, I want this, I want that. That's all Christmas is these days, greed, get as much as you can. And the kid says, come on, Santa, I'm gonna fix you something to eat. Why, what's in it for you? So it's questioning the, the goodness of the child. Like, is there something in it? Like, is the child going to come back and then want something when Santa looks like Santa? We're left with that as a dangling question. Here we have the, um, <clears throat> the single woman who's looking for Mr. Wright. Her name is Lila. And her, here are two of her friends over here with her. So the one friend says, the walk for hunger is a way to help the less fortunate. Other friend, not working, you don't get her attention. Friend, you'll get fresh air and exercise. Still not working, she's not interested. You'll meet men who care about others. Getting warmer, she has a smile. And then who are in great shape and take off their shirts. And he says, we have liftoff and she's obviously now hooked to go on the walk for hunger. And we have a whole series of the walk for hunger. So here she is. How about these new sneakers for the walk for hunger? Friend, 80 bucks? Shouldn't you be donating that money instead, for buy, instead of buying new sneakers? Oh, silly, I don't have $80. I'm just charging it. <clears throat> oh, okay, I guess it's okay. So again, <clears throat> now we're at the beginning of the walk for hunger. So she's talking with one of the guys on the walk. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, you look like a runner. She says, thanks, it's the fancy sneakers. I usually don't run or walk for anything, how about you? And he says, certified couch potato. I'm just here to meet women. She says, does anyone here actually want to help the hungry? Now, why are we going on this walk for hunger? Are we getting something out of it other than helping people? So this whole question of altruism, are we really doing it without expectation? Or do most of the time we help because we have expectations? Oh, and this thing came up again, let me. Mary, I'll give you a a flexible five minute warning now. Thank you so much. I'm about halfway through, so you can imagine how many more comments there are. That's why I said flexible, but. Okay, um, I'll give you a couple more on the um, altruism and then I'll sort of flip to the end. <clears throat> so friend says to Lila, that guy was cute. I know, he asked me out. Congrats, he volunteered for the walk just to meet women. Apparently he doesn't have an altruistic bone in his body. 
Sounds like a perfect match. I know if he has a cool, cop, a cool car, he's a keeper. So here we have the word altruism coming in. You know, sharing some of these words and getting people familiar with some of the words that are along the spiritual path. And here we have the wizard of Id, uh, the dragon. And the woman says, help my fluffy, here's a cat one, is caught in a tree. And the wizard comes along with his dragon and she says, no, get away beast, crunch. And you see that the wizard has broken the branch off and brought the cat down. And the wizard says, never judge a book by its scaly cover. So here we have a dragon who's benevolent, who's kind, who's helpful. And <clears throat> here we have Beely on the bird. This is the father bird and his two children. Uh, father, so chaps, how was your first fishing? Splendid. However, your kit needs fixing. <clears throat> there was a spiky bit on the end of this string. We cut that off. Something could have snagged on it. And there were holes in this net. The holes were tiny. If anything swam in, they would not be able to get away. Father, I'd say you really missed the point, but actually I think you nailed it. We just sit, it's a sport. So the kids are recognizing that fishing could hurt the fish. Beautiful. And the overboard is a story about a pirate ship and Nate is at one of the pirates and he's on ground right now. And there's a, a somebody who's out there for a science project uh, to catch butterflies. And Nate goes and breaks the butterfly net. And he says, get another science project. These two butterflies are talking to each other. Hey, was your primitive brain structure feeling a sense of panic a minute ago? And then the panic went away? Yes, yes, I was just about to tell you. So here we have a whole bunch of ideas in one comic strip. The, the idea that, that butterflies can communicate, that butterflies actually have feelings, that we care about butterflies, and that a pirate is going to help protect a butterfly. And, oh yeah, this was about the whale hunt. hunt. Yeah, you want to fight someone who can fight back? So the pirates shoot a, a cannon over to uh, a whale hunting ship. And it says, it's a little different when someone can fight back, isn't it? Yeah, you'd better run away on the news. And here's an odd one. A Japanese whaling ship was interrupted in its hunt and chased away by a little pirate ship this morning. And this one, this is one that everybody loves. And then I'll switch to the end. A boy and his dog, <clears throat> Red and Rover. Red is the boy, Rover is the dog. Rover, you crazy dog. What are you doing just sitting by yourself in the broiling sun? And Rover is there looking at the sidewalk and you, you see there's a little, little ant right there, tiny little ant. And Rover says, there's an ant trying to make it across the hot sidewalk. There's the ant again. I didn't want him to fry up, so I'm giving him some shade. Red sitting over here in the shade. Then Red comes over and provides more shade for the tiny little ant that's making it across the sidewalk. It almost brings tears to your eyes, you know? It's just so sweet. And if I do this, oop. Oh, this is another one where a boy takes a caterpillar and um, puts it on the wall. And Baldo is a, a pop, popular comic strip and Baldo is a teenager. You wouldn't think a teenager would be so, so good. So I'm going to have to, um, okay, so I'm stopping the screen sharing. Then I'm going to uh, go forward. I told you I had a lot of these. <laughs> um, there's a whole bunch of ethics on ethical living. Um, there's a whole bunch on vegetarianism, which of course everybody's heard about. Mary, uh, we can we can organize a second lecture so you can on the same <laughs> subject, so you can present the entire collection. Okay. 
Okay, on a I can do that. We close for a Wednesday because almost our, all Sundays are closed. Then we do a Wednesday. Is that fine with you? We could do a Wednesday. Let me let me get to the very end. As I told you, there's a lot more here. Um, I've never ever gone through the whole talk anyway. I just sort of skip forward. Where is my ending here? Um, <laughs> here we go. Um, okay, now I'm going to share. I'm going to share this part. Share. Okay, so just to summarize some of the things we've done, the most profound path is finding the spiritual in the commonplace. Buddhists often meditate on matchboxes and other very commonplace objects. So why not meditate on comics? That's maybe, in a, that's a stretch, but you can see. We can see the God in everything and in everyone. We can see the spiritual. We can see that <clears throat> um, the life. We can see the path. We can see the goodness. So comics let us walk in another's shoes and we see the ethical decisions that they make and we see the profound uh, decisions that they have to make, and we're seeing it through another's eyes. And then we can relate that you know, to ourselves. So why study comics? It's wisdom on how to live. It's religion, the theology, culture, history. It's superheroes and regular Joes. It's items of lasting importance. It's justice, faith, peace. It's ethics, karma, redemption, and it's the circular thing. All of this leads um, to <clears throat> the next one. So okay. questions, comments, and thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing some of my love of comics. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for the presentation. Could you please unshare your screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are opening for questions now. May I just begin by saying, I think that um, it's a pity that you couldn't hear everybody's laughter because I'm sure that we were all giggling away. And so that's difficult when you're saying so many profound and funny things that you don't get the feedback that instead we're all having at home. So thank you, it was absolutely wonderful. And thank you for, for quoting me as well. That's also a great honor. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Well, when you said that, I knew I had to quote that. That was so perfect, Juliet. <laughs> Thank you. We're like-minded. I think so. <laughs> Ify, um, can you unmute yourself? Ask to unmute. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Well, Juliet, you're just right. I was laughing through the whole uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. That was a, that, that this, is, this is actually a very funny but also very clever way to introduce certain ideas about spirituality to those people who, have, who know nothing about it and they're very skeptical. Thank you very much for this. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a way that uh, that comic strip authors are reaching out to everyday people. Yeah, they do. They 